All right, yeah, that goes over there. And yeah, can you get that red book on the shelf for me over there? Thank you so much. Hey, friendly readers. Welcome back to Storytime. I, as always, am your ever-welcoming host, Story J. Man, have I got a great episode for you guys today. I have a new story that I've been waiting a long time to share with you guys, along with a new classic and a very, very special guest that I'm sure you and your grown-ups will enjoy. Now, for my first story. My first story is a story with a message that speaks for itself. Friends and fellow readers, I am proud to present to you Little Prince Panther. Once upon a time, in a land not so far away, in a beautiful kingdom ruled by a compassionate and majestic family, and in that family was a little prince, and his name was Little Prince Panther. They gave him that name because everywhere he went, he wore the same four items his mother gave him as gifts, his necklace, his boots, his gloves, and of course, his princely panther cub cow. Now, little Prince Panther was a very well-rounded boy. He read all sorts of books, was very studious in all of the sciences, including the arts, he had many friends, played all sorts of sports, and even took self-defense classes, but was told only to use them if absolutely necessary. Good job. But the most important thing about him was that he had a big heart. Now his friends lived just outside of the city, and over the sea, and in the little town of Old Wounds Harbor, named after its founder, Edwin Old Wound the famous tonic water tycoon, and infamous alternate factorian. And like Edwin Oldwin's statue, the town had a lot that needed to be fixed. Unlike his friends that lived there, there were those in Oldwin's harbor that often dismissed anyone that they considered small. But this land still had a great deal of potential, and a great deal of good people. And it was this that Little Prince Panther did not overlook. Now every day, as Little Prince Panther would go out and into this land, his mother the Queen would talk to him and tell him what she would often tell him every day as he entered this place. Be careful, my son. Though you are a prince, others will treat you differently. Don't get into any arguments, even if you are right. Use your strength to walk away knowing who you are. You are beautiful, you are capable, you are lovable. You are worthy. You are the son of kings and a child of the Most High, and there is nothing that can prevail against that. So Little Prince Panther set out the same route he took every day to the city, down the road, through the forest, over the water, hurling the rocks as he often had to do, until finally he came into the city. Those are right nice gloves you got there, mate. Right? But the first person he met was not one of his friends. It was a little boy, Ulysses Timmy Claude. Now Claude had a habit of talking over people, and with his own personal handheld amplifier, he always had the loudest voice in the room. <laughs> Another thing about Claude was that when he saw something he wanted, he would often bully his way into getting it. So when Claude saw Little Prince Panther in his nice new gloves, he said, Those are nice right gloves you got there, mate. To which Little Prince Panther replied with a thank you, telling him that they were a gift from his mother, the Queen. But Claude with a grin said, Those gloves might look even better on me. To which Little Prince Panther said to him, As for your belief, I cannot change, but these are and always will be my gloves. At that, Claude said, Look, mate, you want to give me those gloves, or you want to fight? Now, even though Little Prince Panther wanted to fight to keep those gloves, 
he remembered what his mother, the queen, told him about walking away. So before Claude could yell and scream to the grown-ups, the young Prince Panther disappointedly took off his gloves, leaving the little prince to go home without them. Now the very next day, little Prince Panther, not one to let one moment spoil another day, set off for the city to see his friends. Down the road, through the forest, hurling over the rocks as he often had to do, until he came into the city. But this time, he came across a little girl at the playground. And her name was Misty Ghostel. Now Misty loved new clothes and everything shiny. And she often had a habit of lying on someone's character to get anything she wanted. And such was the case when she saw Little Prince Panther's shiny necklace. Like, nice necklace, Misty said with a sneer. Thank you, was Little Prince Panther's reply. Let me try it on. It's way more suited for me anyway. But again, Little Prince Panther said, as for your belief, he cannot change. But this is, and always will be, his necklace. But Misty Ghostel told him that if he didn't give it to her, she would yell to the grown-ups that he stole the necklace from her getting him into trouble. So, Little Prince Panther regrettably gave her his necklace, leaving the Little Prince to go home without it. Now the next day was the same thing, but this time the young prince was heated, and it wasn't long before he came across another rival, and that was Barry Mimo. Now Mimo was quite used to getting his way, and getting attention in any way necessary. He yelled for attention, he yelled for toys, he yelled for anything as long as he was getting what he wanted. Now Mimo loved new shoes. And though his boots were only a few weeks old, he noticed they were not as shiny as Little Prince Panther's. So when Mimo saw those boots, he would make sure in getting them, even if it meant lying. Where did you get those boots? Grumbled Mimo. Now Little Prince Panther had enough, but before he even began to argue, Mimo screamed and cried for the grown-ups. He won't give me my boots! Prince Panther couldn't believe it. As he saw the grown-ups coming to rush to Mimo's cries, the little prince hurriedly gave him the boots. This left the little prince panther feeling very powerless, and it also made him very angry. And also, very sad. He went to his mother and told her everything that happened. And they talked and talked into the night until he fell asleep. The next day he returned to the city, and he went the same route as he always had, down the road, through the forest, over the water, hurdling the rocks as he often had to do, until he came to the city, and it wasn't long before he not only came across not one, not two, but all three standing there waiting. And there was Claude, and Claude said, you know the drill, Mike. Hand them over or else we'll have to. But this time, Little Prince Panther said, No, I will not listen to you. You will not speak over me and you will not take what's mine away from me. You will not take my voice and you will not take my power. I am beautiful, I am capable, I am lovable, I am worthy. I am the son of kings and I am a child of the Most High and there is nothing that you can say that can prevail against that and I will not live in the same fear that you do. And with that. He walked past them with his head held high, the prince who would be king. But he paused, turned to them, and said, And if you let go of your fear, you can stand with me instead of against me. 
His words left them feeling very sad and very small. They thought about them for a very long time. Then they turned, scratched the back of their heads, and crept behind the prince. You're right. And we're wrong. They said it's exhausting being me, and they didn't like feeling worried all the time, and that they were tired of being tired. So Claude, Misty, and Mimo returned all of the things they stole, acknowledged their wrongs, and did their best to be better. So it was a start, and that was all Little Prince Panther wanted. And in thanks for his offering and friendship, they gave him something in return. They built him a bridge to make it easier to come back and forth from his home to this new neighboring land, because it was always better to build bridges than to build walls. And if we all live the same way that these wonderful, fanciful, and hopeful children do, in this wonderful fictional tale, then maybe we could take a cue from them, and maybe we too can all live happily ever after. And now, friends and fellow readers, one of my all-time favorite classic books, not a Maurice Sendak, not even an Ezra Jack Keats, but a one-of-a-kind classic Barnes and James. Friendly readers, it is my honor to read aloud to you. Thank you. I am every good thing. I am every good thing. Written by Derek Barnes. Illustrated by Gordon C. James. I am a non-stop ball of energy, powerful and full of light. I am a go-getter, a difference maker, a leader. I am every good thing that makes the world go round. You know, like gravity or the glow of moonbeams over a field of brand new snow. I am good to the core, like the center of a cinnamon roll. Yeah, that good. I am skateboard tricks, scraped knees and elbows. But you know what? I am right back on my feet again. I am one eye open, one eye closed, peeking through a microscope, gazing through a telescope, checking out the spaces around me and plotting out those far off places I have yet to go, but will. I am a gentleman and a scholar. I am kind and polite, like, yes, ma'am. And yes, sir, helping my grandmother cross the street and saying bless you when a stranger has to sneeze. I'm a cool breeze, a perfect paper airplane that glides for blocks, for miles, forever. I am a roaring flame of creativity. I am a lightning round of questions and a star-filled sky of solutions. I am an explorer, planting a flag on every square foot of this planet where I belong. I am a sponge, soaking up information, knowledge, and wisdom. I want it all. And I am all ears. I am Saturday mornings in the summertime. I am two bounces in a front flip off the diving board. I am hilarious. I am the life of the party. I am that smile forming on your face right now. I'm the boom, bap, boom, boom, bap when the bass line thumps and the kick drum jumps. I'm the perfect beat, the perfect rhyme, keeping everything on point and always on time. But you already knew that. I am a grand slam, bases fully loaded. I'm a nasty two-handed dunk, holding on to the rim just to remind you that I'm still the man. Believe that. I am the undisputed champion. I am a highlight reel of magnificence. I am the celebration, the applause, and the standing ovation. I am victory. I am a brother, a son, a nephew, a favorite cousin, a grandson. I am a friend. I 
am real. I am tight hugs, a hand to hold, a shoulder to cry on, if you have to. I hope you never have to. I am here. Although I am something like a superhero, every now and then, I am afraid. I am not what they might call me, and I will not answer to any name that is not my own. I am what I say I am. I am that sound in the forest when the mighty tree falls. I am waves crashing gently on the shore. I am a force of nature, a miracle, a blessing. I am brave. I am hope. I am my ancestor's wildest dream. I am worthy of success, of respect, of safety, of kindness, of happiness. And without a shadow of a doubt, I am worthy to be loved. I am worthy to be loved. Ladies and gentlemen, I can't tell you how honored and blessed I am to have my next guest. He is not only a personal hero of mine, but an inspiration. You know him as Officer Clements on Mr. Rogers, but he is also known as Diva Man. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome. It is my ut utmost honor to welcome to Storytime, Dr. Francois Clements. Thank you, sir, for joining Storytime. How are you today? Well, obviously, I'm just fine, and I'm deeply honored and happy. I'm not only honored, I'm happy to be here with you. I, I um, I read some things about you oh, and about wow. your program, and I'm so excited. Thank you from the bottom of my heart for wow. the invitation. Oh, my gosh. And where would you like to start? I'm, I'm ready. All right. So let me see. How did the character of Officer Clemens come about on Mr. Rogers? In my book, I try to share with people the consternation, that frustration of having uh, this incredible golden egg handed to me. But in that golden egg was a flaw. There was a, a crab that'll jump out and snap you because I did not want to be a police officer, period. But when he asked me to be Officer Clemens, I felt a profound spiritual jolt, like, ooh, mm -hmm. wow. Like and I, there, yeah, there was a part of me, you know, that wanted to say no, because I can't do that. Mm -hmm. Then I kept thinking, as I said, about that golden egg. And I said, what are you thinking about? What, what does a, a policeman do and all that? And basically what he said was, you would be a helper. But I grew up in the ghetto in Youngstown, Ohio. We had to deal with a, a series of uh, uh, incidents with the police in Youngstown that made me afraid of them. It made me stay away from them. Mm -hmm. uh, my, my family told me, keep your mouth shut, keep your eyes down, don't, uh, don't talk to them, don't answer them if necessary, don't answer anything they don't ask you. There were a whole series of survival. So when Fred Rogers mentioned Officer Clemson, all of these memories came flooding back into that meeting. He could not possibly have known, in my opinion, what he was asking. When I got out of that office and I went home and I sat and I thought, and I, I discussed it with a couple of people. What I realized was there were maybe only three or four people in all of Pittsburgh who are members of the American Federation of Television and Radio Artists. And he was offering me an opportunity to join a very select, and in some ways, a very racist union, but mm -hmm. he felt that I could find a place. I mean, there were not that many black men right. on television, period. Black artists uh, had done movies, Woody Strode, and uh, mm -hmm. you know, like that, Pearl Bailey, you know, Poor Gim Best, uh, mm -hmm. Harry Belafonte. I thought, here's first of all, here's my chance to join 
this legion of great, great uh, performers, actors, and singers, I just couldn't throw it away. That's what it amounted to. He was the star. He was the director. He was the producer. He was my mentor. He was becoming my mentor. And so the first couple of times I put on the I put on the outfit, you know, it felt like you're you're doing something new and something special. But mm -hmm. I wasn't um, wedded to Officer Clemens, right? Not at all. I want to also ask about that. That um, especially your grandfather and the singing stick. Well, my grandfather uh, used to take me to the, he was the babysitter mm -hmm. and he would take me to uh, Crab Creek. I think that's the name of the creek down there. And uh, he had a, ma a cane, he walked with a cane. That's all I ever knew. And so he and I would sit there and he would tell, he told me, if you stay awake, the cane is gonna talk to us. And I said, yeah, what the cane gonna, t and he said, it's gonna talk to us and tell us stories about Afrique. That's how I remember him yeah. saying, he didn't say about Africa. Yeah. He said, you have family over there. I said, over there? Where's over there? <laughs> he said, across the ocean. And he would say to me, he was the first one who said, you were not always slaves. And you must not think of yourself that way. You're a proud young boy and gr uh, granddaddy loves you. And your peoples, whether they're near or far, they love you too. And I remember him, I would sit there with grand, my granddaddy and, you know, being a two-year-old, three-year-old guy who didn't understand uh, so much of where he was coming from, I went to sleep. <laughs> and I've always been a sleepyhead anyhow, but I went to sleep and I would wake up granddaddy, granddaddy and say, Buttercup, Buttercup was my nickname. Mm -hmm. And I learned in my later years to cherish that name. I am Buttercup. Buttercup, Buttercup, you better wake up. The, the magic cane was talking and you missed it. Oh, I missed the magic cane. What did the magic cane say? Oh, little boy, little boy, little Buttercup, you better come on to heaven where we are in heaven. Where is heaven, granddaddy? Is that we're in Africa? We came from a land so far away. And he improvised for me the way I, I do it now. I, I don't think about it twice. And he would say, well, 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 child, you're my little darling baby. And I love you oh. one day. One day, one day, you're gonna travel a long way from here, and you're gonna go and sing to those peoples. That's what the magic cane says, Buttercup. You better pay attention. Oh, Lord have mercy. I love that man. Mm. But that's where I started singing, and that's how I started singing. And he would sing to me and I would sing back to him. And half the time we were making up the words. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know what I was singing about or anything. But the day they took the cane away from me, because my mother tells, used to tell me this story. The day they took it away, they said I was grieving too much for him when he died. I burst into, no, 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 no. You can't take that cane away. Yeah, you can't take my cane. No, no, oh no. And I made up songs like that. And they heard me for the first time. And they said, where on earth did you learn to sing like that? And I said, it's my secret. Because it was granddaddy's secret. And after a while, I realized he hadn't, well, everyone knew that it wasn't a real cane singing, but I didn't. So I thought that was our secret. And I cherished it for a long time. I sang all through grade school and junior high. And that's when these boys, you know, we're standing around on corners trying to be uh, the Temptations or mm -hmm. Four Tops. 
and we were trying to be uh, some kind of organization like that. And a bunch of the fellas said, well, he can sing high. Come on, let's get Frostball <laughs> over here and let him do the high part. And that's basically how I got in. And I started singing and loving it. And it was so secular that my parents, my mother did not want me to do it. So I used to sneak and do it. And I'd sneak off, you know, to uh, be at a couple of friends' houses and we would sing together. And then I'd go back home and I wouldn't say anything about it. One day somebody told, here we go again. Mm -hmm. And she told me, you have to stop that devil singing for the devil, a sin. And I didn't stop. But one day, um, there was, a, there was actually a church lady, I think it was Sister Logan, said to her, you know, God has blessed your son uh, with this talent, with this ability, and he's going to appeal to ev some of everybody. And so you have to let him express that. You cannot control yeah. him. You'll ch I remember Sister Logan telling her, you will chase him away. And she did, but there were other factors, uh, the singing and the piano and the music. And she said, well, no son of mine is going to be gay. All that old Karen on, they're gay and they're this and that. And Sister Logan, I remember her saying, you have to love him for who he is. Mm -hmm. she, she was very firm in that. I'm very grateful to her, but my mother did not listen. So I went off and snuck and sang and did performance until I really discovered uh, a great love for Schubert, Mozart, and, uh, and Bach. Uh, and a woman, a social worker, gave me uh, voice, voice lessons. And uh, I, the rest is history. And they said, no, 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 no. You must give yourself over to this great gift. And they were right. What's something you would like to discuss but were never asked? I am a poet. I have written wow. some, some books. And I did this myself. I put together a volume oh, called wow. Songs for stay and it's uh it's my volume of poetry uh -huh. and you know all the um information that i've been sharing that came directly from my basically from my life in my book officer clemens there's another way of expressing a lot of that and so i said i'm going to ask him if i can read a couple poems Absolutely. i've never read them professionally you would be the first I am so honored. Oh my gosh. Let me get, okay. I'm ready. I'm so ready. They win. Okay. <laughs> the first one I decided I would share with you is called Going Up North. Mm -hmm. When mama used to talk about leaving daddy, she'd always say how small I was. She'd say I could hardly walk without holding her hand. When the yellow cab stopped in front of the house, I kept looking for somebody to get out. Then I heard mama say, come on, what you waiting on, child? And I asked her, what about daddy? And that's when she grabbed my hand and slammed the door. We got to the train station. I was so excited. I couldn't stop looking out the, out the window. I kept hoping daddy would hurry and catch up. When the man came and asked for our ticket, I asked him if he'd seen my daddy. And that's when my mama hit me and told me to be good and don't ask nobody no more questions. And then I was quiet all the way up north. Aunt Clara and Aunt Hattie met us at the train station. And mama was so glad. And they hugged and hugged. And when I saw mama crying, I didn't know why if she was so glad. But after that, mama got a job doing day work and I was alone a lot. That's how I grew up, remembering mama crying at the station and wondering when my daddy would catch up. That is beautiful, sir, that is. Thank you very much. This one is called Meadow Street. Harvey was first. Then Russell, Warren was the last one, and you married him. They were my first memories of Meadow Street, the boyfriends, and leaving early mornings dressing for church, and leaving hand in hand through the Christian fog, up the hill and across the Oak Street Bridge, to the Mount Carmel Missionary Baptist Church, and Reverend Rhodes 
will always point us out how you always had us for there every Sunday morning. He would bless us to loud amen and forgive you for staying home to get your rest. A barmaid could only rest on Sundays, he'd say, the Lord's Day. Then you were so young to have four kids and all alone to raise us. But now I see you a different rose, dresses longer, speech slower, and heavy breasted. Evenings when I come home, you sing the same rocking chair. The days rocking you further and further away from me. And I dream of the times you were 22 and I was your baby. And how your hand would rub my skin and call me cup. And that was before Harvey and Russell and Warren and even before Meadow Street. There are many ways to say I love you. There are many ways to say I care about you. Many ways, many ways, many ways to say I love you. That was amazing. I love it. That was incredible. Oh my gosh. Singing and everything. This is um, my mind is blowing. My day is just my, my life is complete. Nice little improvement to the place. So a huge thank you to Dr. Francois Clemens for that interview. And don't be surprised if you see Diva Man again, as he is welcome back at Storytime anytime. Well, my friendly readers, I hope you had just as much fun at Storytime today as I did. And don't forget, your story time is whatever you make it because it's your story so keep telling your story be vocal be courageous be hilarious be a helper and be you and i'll see you next huh? hey your eyes want to take us out all right man see you next time Hey fellow YouTubers, if you like what you see, please hit like and subscribe. And if you want to see more, just click on the button where you can donate and be a paying contributor, where you can see more things like read-alouds, drawing tutorials, virtual field trips, cartoons, and more. See more at StoryJ Storytime, and I'll see you next time. You still here? Look at you hanging out like it's the end of a Marvel movie. Well, lucky for you, I actually have something for those of us who hung out to the end. For you grown ups who hung out, check out Shop Little Lions for eco-friendly tableware for toddlers. And you can follow them on Instagram for future discount codes, especially around the holidays. So make sure to go to Shop Little Lions for all your tiny toddler utensil needs. <laughs>